for an expert to testify under the rules. By the way, does uh, Tennessee uh, use a federal rules-based uh, evidence code? Close, close enough. All right, so it's 90%. So under under the under the federal rules and under Illinois rules, an expert can only testify if they have some specialized knowledge on a particular topic. And so there needs to be some sort of foundation laid for an expert to testify. There are um, two um, famous Supreme Court cases, the Daubert case and the Fry case that talk about the qualifications for an expert to testify to scientific testimony. Usually we don't have that issue in divorce court. We have a business valuation expert. We have some sort of forensic financial expert, or we have a child custody evaluator. There's not really much controversy with regard to that subject matter. And so you don't necessarily need to lay any sort of extraordinary foundation for them to be qualified to testify. But if I wanted to call, say, for example, a farmer, because I'm trying to prove up what Farmer Jones' income is, and if you have represented any farmers in a divorce case, it's a nightmare trying to figure out what the farmer's income is. You've got crops in the field, you've got crops that have been harvested in silos. And so you let's say you want to call a farmer in who is an expert on how farmers generate income, how they, how they finance their operations and how they pull money out of the enterprise. That's a little bit unusual. So you would need to lay a foundation for the court as to this particular expert's specialized knowledge on this particular subject matter. And what would that entail? Well, in this particular example, you'd want to have this person say that they have been in farming operations, let's say, both directly as a farmer and or as a CPA that has worked with farmers for 36 years or whatever the time period is, that they have done tax returns for farmers, that they have been consulting with farmers in terms of their enterprises, et cetera, et cetera. That's the sort of foundation that you would need to lay for that particular expertise. And there's nothing really that controversial about something like that. Now, a different subject matter might be, let's say I wanna bring in an expert who claims to have a test that they can administer to somebody to see if that person is um, an alcoholic, let's say. And I think there probably are tests like that. That was a bad example. I was gonna say if somebody's a liar or not, but we have lie detectors that do that sort of thing. But if there's some sort of unusual scientific test that somebody wants to offer, here's a good example. In Illinois years ago, our Supreme Court ruled on an issue of whether or not parental alienation syndrome was a syndrome, which is a very controversial subject, right? We all know that parents alienate. The question is, is it a mental disease? And a doctor came in, a famous doctor by the name of Richard Gardner, who kind of invented this concept. And for him to be qualified to testify, he needed to establish that there was a scientific basis to his opinions. So the lawyers needed to lay out a, uh, a foundational um, uh, line of questions to show that this was credible enough for the court to rely on it. So that in general, the, the foundation for an expert is you need to show that they have specialized knowledge. If it's some unusual scientific knowledge, you need to show enough information to show that the general scientific community accepts this as being um, legitimate. And then assuming you do that, then they, they could testify and offer their opinions. In general, if we're just calling Joe Blow business evaluator or Dr. Smith, the um, custody evaluator, you need to have that person qualified, at least under our law, as an expert. So you're gonna do 
preliminary questions. Now, when we at the Trial Institute teach people, we kind of walk through this dance, and this is how I personally do it as well. I would have the, the person called to the stand. I would first put in their CV. And you want to make sure when you're preparing the case that their CV is current and complete. So I would show the witness the curriculum PK, and I would say, is this your CV? And they would say, yes. I would say, is it current and complete? They would say, yes. Uh, as of you know, last month, whatever the case is. Then I would offer it as one of my exhibits. And uh, presumably the court would admit it at that point. Then I would ask the expert questions about their CV that are more in the nature of enhancing their credibility, but also serving the dual purpose of laying the groundwork to offer them as an expert witness. So I'd want to highlight for this witness um, the fact that they wrote a book on child custody uh, methodologies and testing in 2020. And I might have them talk a little bit about uh, the, the syllabus of that book. I might have them highlight the fact that they've been doing custody evaluations for 36 years. I might have them talk about the fact that they've spoken 75 times. I might have them um, talk about the fact that they've conducted over 2,000 child custody evaluations over the course of their career. I'd have them testify that courts have found them to be an expert witness on 100% of the occasions that they've been offered. Then at that point, when we go through that dance, by the way, that's the sort of stuff that's persuasive. I don't really care that they were an Eagle Scout. That doesn't really matter to me. That might be on their CV. Hit the highlights, hit the stuff that affects your case. Then you would say, Your Honor, after you laid that foundation, I would tender Dr. Um, Smith as an expert on child custody evaluation and child psychology. At that point, you may or may not get an objection, likely not, if this guy testifies all the time. The judge would then qualify the doctor as the expert witness, and then you'd move into the substantive portion of your testimony. Everybody get that? Any questions? All right, pretty fundamental. Mr. Baskin, I got a question. So um, can you talk about dealing with a scenario where an expert's uh, opinion may exceed the scope of their specialized knowledge. For instance, going back to the example you mentioned earlier about the person uh, that, so to speak, can testify about this person being an alcoholic or not. Come to find out this person just collects the sample, ships off the sample for testing, and then you find out that they're trying to testify to say that this person is an alcoholic, but they're not a toxicologist or even the one to administer the uh, testing. So is the question, is that person eligible to testify as an expert witness? Y yes, so to speak, uh, the, in the scenario of this is your own witness and or this is an opposing expert, how would you handle that? Well, first of all, an expert can rely on any information that an expert would typically rely on in rendering their opinion or drawing their conclusions. So the fact that an expert maybe relies on a scientific test that they don't actually administer, but it's reasonable under the circumstances and in their field, they ordinarily would rely on such a test. Maybe there was a blood draw from a hospital, for example, and they're not a phlebotomist or they're not a a forensic medical examiner or whatever the person is that looks at that. If it's reasonable within their industry and in their world to rely on that, it would be acceptable for, for the testimony to come in in reliance on that. Okay. Now, it certainly would be a line of questions on cross-examination, right? So right. if I'm cross-examining, I might raise some doubt by saying, if hypothetically, all things being equal, that test result was scored inaccurately. How would that affect your conclusions or your opinions? Well, they have to cop to that, right? If they were relying on bum data and, and they don't admit that it might affect their conclusions, they're dead in the water. 